Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so today's webinar is Epilepsy and EEG Findings in Individuals with Phelan McDermott Syndrome. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Again, we use GoToWebinar for our webinars. So on the right-hand side, you should be able to see a section that says questions, and you may have a chat feature. Either of those are fine. If you want to ask questions at any point throughout the presentation, we'll collect those, and we will have our speaker address those at the end. But at any point, if you have a question, feel free to type those into the box. So our speaker today is Dr. Jimmy Holder. He's an investigator in the Jan and Dan Duncan Neurological Research Institute at Texas Children's Hospital and assistant professor of pediatrics in the Division of Neurology and Developmental Neuroscience at Baylor College of Medicine. He received his undergraduate education at the John Ho Johns Hopkins University, followed by an MD and PhD in human genetics at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. He then completed his clinical training in pediatrics and child neurology at Baylor College of Medicine. Dr. Holder has established a synaptopathy clinic in Texas Children's Hospital to care for children with neurological disorders due to mutations in genes critical for synapse function. In his laboratory, he studies how mutations in these same genes result in molecular, neuronal, and circuit abnormalities. He is further investigating genetic modifiers of these genes as potential therapeutic entry points for neurodevelopment disorders. So I'm very excited to welcome our speaker. Okay, great. Uh, well, again, I just want to um, thank you for inviting me to speak to all of you today and uh, for all of you joining me on today's webinar. Um, so I'll talk about epilepsy and uh, EEG and Phelan McDermott syndrome, and I'll really start with kind of a, um, a general background about uh, seizures and epilepsy, how they're diagnosed and treated with McDermott syndrome. Uh, so today, 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 uh, objectives that we'll go over, we'll define what seizures are, what epilepsy is, I'll show you some examples of different types of seizures. Uh, we'll describe, 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 kind of in general terms, uh, treatments that are available for epilepsy. epilepsy. Um, and then we'll uh, describe some life some threatening complications associated with epilepsy. I'll uh, have a quick review of the literature of epilepsy and Phelan McDermott syndrome, then describe our experience here, here at the Children's Hospital um, uh, with epilepsy and Phelan McDermott syndrome. And then uh, I'll end uh, by uh, presenting some of the data from the natural history study um, showing uh, long-term EEG recordings in Phelan McDermott syndrome. So first, uh, we'll talk about seizures. Um, so, so a seizure is a transient disruption of brain function due to abnormal and electrical activity or discharges in brain cells. In epilepsy, the definition of epilepsy is really fairly simple. It's uh, 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 just more than one unprovoked seizure. So uh, unprovoked seizure is one that's not uh, infection of the central nervous system. So two seizures that kind of, 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 that come out of the blue, um, that defines epilepsy. EEG or uh, electroencephalography, it's basically a brainwave test. We use that uh, for a number of things. Sometimes we use it to confirm uh, seizures or epilepsy, although often uh, seizures or, or uh, epilepsy is, that, is a clinical diagnosis uh, based on history, description of events that happened and the concerning for seizure. Um, but EEG, sometimes we can capture seizures on EEG uh, to make uh, the formal diagnosis, or often we use them to characterize the type of seizure that's present, 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 or the location of the brain uh, that has a propensity for uh, developing seizures. And then MRI or magnetic resonance imaging is a uh, imaging technique that we use to visualize, 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 visualize the structure of, uh, of an organ system. Uh, here, of course, uh, we're talking about the brain. We, off, we typically, 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 typically perform an MRI in any individual, uh, MRI of the brain in any individual that, that experienced a single seizure. And so individuals that have uh, a history of a seizure, again, um, frequently the sort of uh, uh, course of, diagnos uh, of diagnos uh, diagnosing seizures involves an outpatient EEG, an outpatient MRI, and then potentially medication if there have been more, two or more uh, unprovoked seizures. 
So seizures uh, come in a, a lot of different uh, flavors or varieties. Um, can it can it can it can it can it can it can appear uh, in uh, many different ways? Um, so here is listed some of the the more common uh, semiologies or types of seizures that we see. Uh, the first are absent 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 seizures. Um, these are brief, usually 10 to 15 second at most uh, staring spells. Uh, that can occur with or without stereotopies, that is kind of repetitive movements of the lips or of the fingers um, during that 10 to 15 second event. And individuals that are having an absence seizure, uh, again, are, are kind of staring either straight ahead or, um, you know, perhaps even, you know, through, through you and um, are typically cannot be aroused by calling their name or shaking uh, their shoulder or something like that. Uh, uh, Comps partial seizures uh, actually can present several different ways. Uh, one way is also as a staring spell, uh, but often a, a longer staring spell than an absent seizure, uh, lasting certainly usually greater than 30 seconds and can often last for several minutes. Um, this is frequently associated with eye deviation. Um, there can be can be can be can be motor uh, manifestations of this type of seizure as well. That all that all can either present as a single arm uh, shaking or single leg shaking, or even more complex movements, uh, such as uh, bicycling movements of the legs. And these seizures uh, can evolve into a generalized seizure um, with rhythmic shaking or uh, stiffening of the entire body. Uh, atonic seizures are often called drop attacks. These are due to sudden loss of tone. Um, and I'll show you in a minute an example, a, a video example of that. A tonic seizure um, can actually either be partial or generalized. Um, it's increased tone or, or stiffening of either a single body part or, or frequently of the entire body um, without the, 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 the rhythmic jerking or clonic movements um, that, can, that are often uh, typically associated with seizures. And then a generalized tonic-clonic seizure is probably what all of you um, <laughs> Um, Hi, Dr. You know, vision as a seizure, generalized increase in tone. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. There's a bit of an echo that keeps going off. I'm not sure what it is, but I think some others are hearing it too. Do you want to try maybe calling in instead of, are you on a computer audio? I, I am. Is this better or is it the same? Keep talking. We'll, we'll, I'll, I'll interrupt you if it happens again. Okay. Thank you. I'll try moving the microphone away from the speaker and that might help. Okay. Um, generalized tonic clock seizures are kind of what we envision as a seizure with generalized increase in tone and then rhythmic uh, movements, um, uh, which are often described as clonic. And then finally, myoclonic seizures. Uh, these are very, usually very brief, sudden jerking movements that are uh, not rhythmic in nature. So I'll show you a few quick, 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 quick examples of uh, different types of seizures. So this is an absent seizure. Um, and this child is actually hyperventilating at this point, being asked to breathe in and out very fast. And then you'll see in a minute that she stops and you can see sort of picking at her fingers, her, her lips are kind of smacking. And this is, uh, this is a seizure. And then here in a minute, she'll look away from her lap, and that's when the seizure is over. So that's a, uh, an example of an absent seizure. A complex partial seizure, as I mentioned, can look like several different things. But here's an example of a motor complex partial seizure, where you'll see in a minute um, rhythmic movement of this little girl's legs. And this is while she's having the seizure. And you'll see in a minute, there's, uh, her eyes are deviating um, to the left. And now the seizure's over. And then an atonic seizure, again, is a drop attack. Um, these are very sudden, very brief, but uh, can result in complete loss of tone um, and, and can actually be um, uh, can cause significant injury. And that, that was the uh, brief loss of tone, and then she's right back to her normal self. And then this is an example of myoclonic seizures. You can see these sudden rhythmic jerking, moving, 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 moving. These are generalized myoclonic uh, seizures, but you can have also um, 
focal myoclonic seizures involving one extremity or one side of the body. So I'm now going to go into some of the different types of treatments available for epilepsy. First, we'll start with pharmacologic treatments. Uh, sort of the mainstay of treating focal or partial onset seizures. These are seizures that begin in just one part of the brain um, and, and typically, at least at the beginning, involve just uh, 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 one part of the body, either uh, one half of the body or, or even one arm or one leg or facial uh, or head deviation. Um, and and uh, voltage gated and sodium channels are, are, are sort of again, kind of the mainstay of treating uh, these type of seizures. Um, these include a number of medications. Um, uh, the, 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 the classic uh, voltage gated sodium channel inhibitors include phenytoin, phosphosphenidin, uh, carbamazepine, oxcarbazepine, um, and newer uh, derivative of oxcarbazepine uh, called eslacarbazepine. Um, there are other sodium channel inhibitors um, that are a little bit more specialized. One of those includes rufenamide. Rufenamide is uh, typically used only for uh, Lennox gestosterone. Uh, Lacosamide um, is also used for partial onset seizures. It's a bit of a newer medication, works slightly differently than the other uh, voltage sodium, uh, voltage gated sodium channel inhibitors. And then lamotrigine is a sodium channel inhibitor. It actually has some uh, other mechanisms of action that uh, make it um, useful for both partial onset and generalized seizures. Benzodiazepines are another uh, class of medications that are used for seizures. Um, they are useful for both partial onset and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and generalized seizures. Uh, in contrast to the voltage-gated sodium channel inhibitors, there's when to decrease excitability of neurons, these medications increase the inhibition of neurons. Um, and the classic examples of these include diazepam, midazolam, and, and clonazepam. Uh, the main uh, side effect associated with this class of medications is drowsiness. Um, the, the top three medications there, um, individuals can also develop tolerance, meaning that they need larger and larger amounts of these medicines in order to be efficacious. And that's actually somewhat what somewhat limits their usefulness in terms of long-term use for seizures, although in some cases we do use them for that. Uh, 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 uh. Okay, um, so I, I think what I was saying with the clobazam is a uh, um, bit of a, a new class of benzodiazepines uh, that does not have the same issues with tolerance or not as significant as issues with tolerance as uh, the traditional benzodiazepines. And so it is used um, fairly commonly uh, as a uh, uh, maintenance medication for epilepsy. And then uh, the class of medications uh, um, the teracetams uh, includes levoteracetam, um, as well as a newer medication, uh, brivaracetam, um, and these are uh, efficacious for, again, both partial onset and generalized seizures, uh, as well as uh, can be quite efficacious for uh, myoclonic seizures. Um, these medicines all, um, have a different side effect profile. They're actually quite good in terms of not interacting with other medications, uh, not requiring any sort of blood levels to be measured, or um, levels of uh, in, uh, liver enzyme activity. Um, however, they can uh, be associated with uh, behavioral side effects, often irritability in children. Um, they can rarely, but occasionally, uh, uh, progress to psychosis. Um, and so I, I do use this medication uh, sometimes for kids with, uh, with autism and intellectual disability, but its use can be limited because of those side effects. And then a relatively new uh, class of medications are the glutamate receptor antagonists. Um, and and the, the only example of this type of medication that's FDA approved right now is uh, parampinol. Um, again, this can also be efficacious for both partial onset and generalized seizures. Um, it has a, a fairly good side effect profile, often associated with drowsiness when first starting or, or with titrating up. Uh, it can also have some of those uh, behavioral side effects that we talked about for levoteracetam. And then topiramate and zanisamide are kind of an older class of uh, medicines that are still um, uh, quite useful uh, for treating epilepsy. Uh, they have a, uh, um, a broad uh, usefulness for partial onset myoclonic and generalized seizures. Um, their major side effects uh, to be aware of include um, it can have some drowsiness, although not as much as some of the other medications. 
um, they can decrease sweating, um, which can be a significant issue um, for children with Salem McDermott syndrome because of the uh, lack of sweating or anhydrosis that sometimes is associated with Salem McDermott syndrome. Uh, about 1% of individuals that take these medications uh, can develop uh, kidney stones. Um, and usually um, this can be avoided by simply asking uh, families if there's any family history of kidney stones or any history of kidney stones in the individual taking these medications. Um, and then finally, um, at least with neurotypical kids, there can be some word finding difficulty associated with these medications um, that may also lead to some cognitive changes in children with intellectual disability or with autism. And then uh, the next class, uh, really just single medication, is valproic acid. Um, this is a, a very good medication in terms of usefulness uh, for uh, decreasing seizures, especially in individuals with intractable epilepsy. Um, can work for partial onset, myoclonic, and generalized seizures as well. Um, however, it has a, a side effect profile um, that does somewhat limit its use. Um, uh, this one can, is associated with, or can be associated with um, uh, uh, side effects of blood production, um, side effects associated with liver dysfunction, with pancreatic dysfunction, as well as some cognitive side effects. So often used as a second or third line medication uh, for those individuals with intractable epilepsy. And then one that, of course, uh, many people are, are very interested in these days um, are the uh, cannabidiols. Um, and there's one FDA-approved medication uh, as of now, which is Epidiolex. Um, and it is currently approved for lennox gastaut syndrome as well as Dravet syndrome. Uh, lennox gastaut syndrome is a, um, a collection of um, uh, phenotypes and seizure types um, that lead to its diagnosis. It's not based on a, a single genetic diagnosis, whereas Dravet syndrome um, is, is based on a handful of genetic diagnoses related, related primarily to sodium channel uh, mutations. In addition to the pharmacologic treatments, there are non-pharmacologic treatments. Um, probably uh, the one that um, uh, is most commonly used is vagus nerve stimulation. Um, this is where a uh, nerve stimulator is implanted in the chest uh, directly under the skin. And a lead, an electrode, uh, goes from that nerve stimulator um, up into the neck where it's connected to the vagus nerve. Um, this neurostimulator uh, then fires on a preset schedule that's programmed into the stimulator. Um, and the newer versions of these stimulators can actually uh, detect uh, changes in um, vital signs, primarily in, in pulse. Um, that are associated with seizure and fire uh, based on those changes to try to stop seizures. Um, the, the exact mechanism of how this works really is not fully understood. Um, and this is uh, a treatment that is typically reserved, again, for intractable epilepsy. That is epilepsy that has uh, not been responsive to two different pharmacologic treatments. Um, in general, about a third of individuals um, that have uh, these devices implanted um, with intractable epilepsy have a significant improvement in, in, their, um, in their seizure frequency, their seizure burden. Um, a newer neurostimulation technique is responsive neurostimulation. In this case, uh, the neurostimulator is planted uh, uh, directly into the brain. There are actually two electrodes. One is basically a, a strip of, uh, uh, of EEG uh, leads that can detect uh, it's, in, it's placed over a region of the brain that uh, is known to be a uh, focus for seizures. So it can detect when a seizure is occurring. Um, and then the second lead will stimulate uh, that region of the brain to try to stop the seizure. Uh, another uh, non-pharmacologic uh, treatment is epilepsy surgery. And this is really a huge topic that I could spend a whole hour talking about. Uh, one of the more common types of epilepsy surgery is uh, temporal lobectomy, which is removal of uh, either a portion or uh, the majority of the temporal lobe. Uh, this is uh, reserved for individuals, again, with intractable epilepsy um, that has been mapped to, come, to be coming primarily from one region of the brain, uh, one, uh, one of the temporal lobe. 
And then uh, one, just to touch on one other type of surgery uh, is corpus callosotomy. Um, this is a surgery where the major connection between the left and right hemisphere, which is called the corpus callosum, is, uh, um, is uh, severed. Um, and this is reserved primarily for those individuals with intractable atonic seizures, those drop attacks. Uh, and this works by um, decreasing the ability of the left and right sides of the brain to communicate with each other and, and uh, specifically preventing propagation of seizure activity from the left to the right or right to the left. Um, that can, can be very use, uh, very efficacious for uh, decreasing um, the, uh, the full expression of those atonic attacks, so complete loss of tone and dropping uh, to the ground. And then finally, uh, the last non-pharmacologic treatment is ketogenic diet. Again, uh, a treatment reserved for intractable epilepsy. Um, in, in this case, um, that, an individual's diet is changed such that they consume a very small amount of carbohydrates, about 5%. And the majority of uh, their food that they use for generating energy comes from fat. And 75% of the diet, about 75% of the diet uh, comes from fat, and then proteins um, are present as well as uh, building blocks. Um, one uh, thing to note about the ketogenic diet is that the ketogenic diet should really only be uh, initiated under the supervision of a uh, neurologist or epileptologist that is uh, very well versed in the ketogenic diet as well as a dietitian. Um, and that's because uh, the ketogenic diet um, can result in uh, increased acidity um, of the blood and, uh, and this can potentially cause cognitive um, issues and, and even uh, severe side effects. Um, requiring hospitalization. So should not be initiated um, on your own at home, should be under the, the care of a neurologist or epileptologist. All right, so uh, just to describe some of the life-threatening complications associated with epilepsy, and really this is why, you know, do we need to, to uh, aggressively treat um, seizures, especially in those individuals with, with very frequent seizures. So one of the uh, you know, conditions we, we always worry about is called status epilepticus. And this is basically a state of uh, either continuing seizure for, um, uh, for a long period of time or recurrent seizures where the individual uh, does not completely recover uh, between the seizures. Uh, by definition, it, it's uh, 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 described as a seizure lasting longer than 30 minutes. But in clinical practice, we really treat uh, for status epilepticus after a seizure has continued for greater than five minutes. So one of the things we worry about with status epilepticus is the, the risk of mortality associated with uh, this very prolonged seizure. Um, and this is, is data showing that seizures lasting longer than one hour were associated with significant uh, decreased survival um, in the 30 days following the, the seizure compared to those that are shorter. Um, this data comes primarily from, uh, from adults and, and the elderly, although there were some children in the study as well. And if we look at that mortality in, in individuals that have had status epilepticus, certainly mortality is greatest in the uh, elderly, and that's probably in, in large part because of the cause of the prolonged seizure, uh, things like a, a sudden massive stroke or a tumor or uh, an infection of the central nervous system. But you can see that even in children, um, there is some uh, risk of mortality associated with these prolonged seizures. So certainly something that if a seizure is occurring longer than five minutes, you want to call 911 and, uh, and, and get treatment as soon as possible. Uh, a second uh, entity that we worry about is sudden unexpected death in epilepsy or SUDA. Uh, this can occur within minutes or hours following a seizure. Um, seems to be most common in adolescents or young adults. This is, uh, this is a very rare um, uh, event associated with epilepsy. Um, but again, more common perhaps in adolescents and young adults. Uh, seems to be more common in individuals with generalized seizures, but rather than those focal seizures beginning in just one part of the brain. Um, why this occurs in, in those rare individuals with epilepsy is not really understood. Um, it could be because of cardiac issues, it could be because of apnea or um, uh, reduction in breathing or other um, what are called autonomic dysfunctions. And this is just uh, some of the data uh, showing that 
two death is really quite rare, but seems to be a bit more common in young, uh, late adolescent, young adulthood. So what do we know about epilepsy and family McDermott syndrome? Uh, so there have been 12 retrospective studies describing uh, seizure prevalence in individuals with family McDermott syndrome. And there is a wide uh, range of prevalences reported from 14 to 70 percent. Um, there has now been one prospective study uh, as part of the natural history study for family McDermott syndrome uh, that found a prevalence of uh, about 40 percent. Um, detailed description of seizure types, frequencies, medications, and EEG abnormalities have really only uh, uh, been reported in two studies, one from, from our group and, and one from the a natural history study, and we'll talk about both of those next. Uh, really, the first uh, report um, detailing seizures and EG abnormalities in individuals with family McDermott syndrome uh, was this study from Italy where they looked at six individuals with uh, deletions of 22Q13. Um, a total of six individuals were enrolled in the study. Three of those had a history of epilepsy. Uh, one of those had a history of a deletion that did not encompass shank 3. And another had a history of a, a serious brain infection during infancy called meningitis. Um, so the, the results of the study have to be taken in that context. Um, all of these individuals, again, only six individuals, had a relatively benign course. And uh, the EEG abnormalities that they primarily identified were multifocal uh, spike and wave. Another study in 2014. Um, found that the prevalence of epilepsy um, increased with uh, increasing age. And so you can see here that adults greater than 18 years of age diagnosed with family McDermott syndrome, over half of them have a, a history of epilepsy. And this seems, uh, the prevalence seems to increase again with increasing age uh, with less, uh, around 15%, 10 to 15%, less than five years of age diagnosed with epilepsy. Again, up to over 50% in adulthood. So next I'll describe um, our, our experience at Texas Children's Hospital. Um, at the time that we uh, reported our experience now a, few, a couple of years ago, um, we had 24 individuals enrolled in our study. Um, and at least uh, and 11 out of those 24 had a, a history of at least one seizure during their lifetime. So about 46% had a history of at least one seizure. Uh, when we compared um, our data with all of the uh, data from other studies, at that time it was all of the retrospective studies, um, the combined prevalence was about 32 percent. Uh, and in our group, at least, uh, the mean age of onset was about five years of age with a, a quite uh, a wide range of uh, onset, age of onset. Um, seizure burden uh, varied from uh, individuals only having one seizure in their lifetime uh, to uh, rare individuals having a, a large number of seizures every day. Uh, the most common type of seizure that we identified was atypical absence. Um, these again are, are primarily staring spells, but a little bit uh, unusual in, in some sense, uh, typically uh, in terms of their the EG findings that we see. Um, but we saw a wide variety of different seizure types, including generalized tonic-clonic, atonic, myoclonic, and focal. Um, two of the individuals in our study had a history of status epilepticus, um, and uh, two individuals that had a diagnosis of lung post syndrome. Well, we found uh, actually the majority of individuals um, in our cohort had a, a history of an abnormal EEG, and this included um, a, a number of individuals um, that had never been diagnosed with epilepsy, never had a history of a clinical seizure, but they still had uh, significant abnormalities on their EEG. Uh, the most common abnormality that we found was slowing or absence of the occipital dominant rhythm. Uh, this is kind of a baseline uh, rhythmic activity that we see in, uh, in most individuals. Um, and, and this was either slow or absent in about 40% of the kids that, in our cohort. Um, after that, we had focal spike and slow wave discharges, and again, about 40%. And then generalized spike and slow wave discharges in about 20%. And again, when we saw abnormal EEGs present um, in individuals, even without a history of epilepsy. Um, we did find that individuals with multiple seizure types were more likely to have a significantly slowed occipital dominant rhythm, suggesting probably greater dysfunction, uh, neuronal dysfunction in those individuals. 
So um, this is just a, a quick example of uh, what an EEG looks like. Um, this is from an awake individual. If you look at the left side of the panel, you can see uh, small amplitude, uh, high frequency um, uh, waveforms that are, are absolutely uh, typical. Um, and then in the middle here, um, in the red box, are what we call uh, spike and slow wave activity. And this is uh, not a seizure, but an indication of a propensity for seizures. Sometimes they refer to this as irritability, neuronal irritability uh, that can predispose to epilepsy. We also looked at uh, the structure of uh, brains in individuals with family dermis syndrome and epilepsy and uh, found a wide variety of um, abnormalities, um, although none of them uh, clearly correlated between, uh, clearly correlated with seizures. And on the left here, that bright white strip um, kind of in the middle of the brain is the corpus callosum. It's a bit thin in this uh, individual with Galindodermic syndrome. And then on the white, uh, sorry, on the right, you see uh, in the middle uh, of the brain, um, the, the darker area, that's actually white matter, and you can see some lightly shaded areas which are um, called T2 hyperintensities, um, somewhat nonspecific changes in white matter. Uh, again, they don't necessarily directly correlate with seizures, but probably correlate um, with a diagnosis of phalan dermis syndrome. Um, in terms of treatment, um, patients in, uh, seen in, in my clinic have been prescribed uh, by myself or others 16 different uh, anticonvulsant medications. Uh, none were clear, uh, uh, clearly superior to uh, others in the, in the group. Um, two patients um, that I see have had uh, vagus nerve stimulators placed and some improvement in their seizure burden. And then we did have one child, uh, one individual um, who had a uh, corpus callosotomy uh, due to atonic seizures and had a significant improvement of the severity of those seizures. Uh, I did want to mention uh, one clinical trial, um, which is um, um, hopefully starting soon. Um, uh, which is looking at specifically at family McDermott syndrome, uh, individuals with family McDermott syndrome and a history of epilepsy, and using uh, abnormalities on EEG as one of the clinical endpoints um, uh, to show efficacy of the study. And then finally, I'm going to end with a brief discussion of the uh, study that uh, now was published, I guess, about two years ago from the Natural History Study, uh, looking at uh, prolonged EEGs. These are EEGs that are about 24 hours in length in individuals with phalan McDermott syndrome. So in this study, they had um, 16 participants. 43% um, were diagnosed with epilepsy, very similar to what we saw and, um, in general, what's been reported in the literature. Um, most had a history of generalized slowing of that occipital dominant rhythm. Um, a quarter of the individuals in the study had uh, epileptiform activity or that sort of neuronal irritability on routine EEG, whereas when they then looked at uh, prolonged EEGs, EEGs lasting uh, 24 hours or so, they saw 75% of those individuals, of, of those individuals had uh, epileptiform activity. And in this study, no seizures were, were uh, recorded during any of the EEGs. And so this is just an example from that paper on the left is an EEG uh, from an individual with phalan McDermott syndrome uh, during wakefulness. Um, and this is uh, uh, the EEG uh, example shown here is completely normal. This is, you can see kind of small amplitude, but high frequency activity in, uh, in all of the lines there. On the right uh, is EEG from the same patient um, while they're asleep. So you can see kind of on the uh, left side of, of that right panel um, that the uh, frequency and amplitude of the activity has decreased. But then in the box, um, in the red box there, you see a sudden burst of higher frequency, higher amplitude activity. Um, and, and this indicated potentially that there can be um, worsening of epileptiform discharges during sleep um, and, you know, uh, possibly leading to, uh, to nighttime seizures, so something definitely to uh, keep in mind. And then this is just a summary of, of that data, um, of all of their data um, from that study, and, and basically uh, what they found was that um, when they recorded EEGs uh, for 24 hours versus just a outpatient one-hour EEGs, they were able to capture 
more of these epileptiform discharges. Again, these are not seizures, but uh, just uh, um, evidence of neuronal hyperexcitability or irritability. Um, however, what, they did not see a, a difference in terms of uh, their ability to capture seizures. And then a study um, published uh, just last year looked uh, now um, at individuals with point mutations in shank three. So Phelan McDermott syndrome is typically uh, defined or classically defined as individuals with deletions of chromosome 22. Um, associated with shank 3 deletion. Um, so you can have a point mutation where the uh, genetic abnormality is only in the shank 3 gene. Um, and in these individuals, uh, what we found is that, uh, and this was a collaboration between myself and uh, uh, Alex Colomzon at, at Mount Sinai, uh, what we found is that uh, the frequency of seizures was perhaps slightly lower in individuals with uh, shank 3 point mutations compared to those with deletions. Although um, I will note that the number of individuals in, in both groups is relatively small, um, and the difference is, is not great, uh, it's not huge. Um, uh, and just as a point of reference, the frequency or the prevalence of seizures in uh, neurotypical individuals is uh, somewhere around 1 to 2%. Um, so both of these groups have a significant increase in their prevalence of uh, epilepsy. And so I'm going to end uh, with this, which is the practice parameters, uh, which uh, some of you have may, may have seen. If not, you should definitely go to the Family McDermott Syndrome Foundation website, um, where I think this is uh, still there, um, and uh, with some of the uh, common uh, symptoms or phenotypes associated with uh, Family McDermott Syndrome. And focusing on the upper right side there, um, you see under neurology, um, seizures and structural brain abnormalities um, should be evaluated for. Um, the practice parameters suggest overnight video EEG. Um, in, in practice, um, uh, most neurologists would first obtain a, uh, an outpatient EEG um, and, and then go from there in terms of whether or not uh, a prolonged EEG was necessary. Um, and then brain imaging um, and head circumference monitoring uh, should definitely uh, be undertaken um, in any individual with, uh, with epilepsy. And, uh, and probably most, if not all, individuals with family McDermott syndrome at least one uh, in terms of brain imaging. So that's uh, all I have. Uh, here are some, a few acknowledgments, and I'll just highlight Michael Quash, um, who's a neurophysiologist here at um, Texas Children's Hospital and help us with uh, our uh, evaluation of kids with epilepsy and Shailen McDermott syndrome. So that's what I have, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much. That was excellent. We do have a couple of questions that have come in um, that we can go through, but if anybody else has questions, feel free to type it in. We have about 15 minutes so we can run through these. Um, so the first question for you is, does the EEG always pick up activity? Um, absence seizures have been observed, but were not picked up on EEG. Right. That's a great question. So um, the EEG is not used to diagnose epilepsy. So uh, epilepsy is, di is a clinical diagnosis, again, based on, uh, on clinical history um, and as well as sometimes examination findings. Um, we do not use EEG to confirm the presence of epilepsy. And, and the reason is just what you're saying is that in a one-hour EEG or even in a 24-hour EEG, we may not pick up seizures. A seizure may just not happen during that time. Um, so we don't use the EEG to confirm the diagnosis. Um, we often use the EEG to help classify the type of epilepsy that's present. Um, and in rare occasions, we do use EEG uh, to determine whether um, abnormal events are seizures, but that can often require very prolonged EEGs, which are just not possible for every individual with epilepsy. So it's absolutely possible that a routine EEG would not pick up seizures. Um, and the di again, the diagnosis of epilepsy is a clinical one based on clinical history. Okay, next question. I think this is referring to just a couple of slides ago. You mentioned generalized slowing. What, what do you mean by that? Right, right. So, um, 
when an EEG is performed, we put, um, I didn't really go through this in too much detail, but we put um, what are called leads, or basically uh, electrodes, small wires, on the scalp um, of an individual. And we typically put um, around 20 of these leads um, all over the scalp to record electrical activity. Uh, what's been found with now, I guess, 60, 70 years of uh, experience recording EEGs is that in the vast majority of individuals, um, there is a characteristic type of electrical activity that comes from the back of the head or from the back, from the back part of the brain. Um, and this is called the occipital dominant rhythm. Um, and this rhythm has a characteristic frequency or number of waves that occur per second. And this changes um, as you go through childhood. It's slower when you're first born, about four of these waves per second, up until adulthood where you have about 10 to 12 per second. So um, what has been found, uh, not just for family McDermott syndrome, but for many types of intellectual disability and autism, is that this posterior dominant rhythm can be slower than expected for age. So that's what I meant by slowing or absence of the occipital dominant rhythm. This does not necessarily, um, cor this does not correlate with uh, whether an individual is likely to have seizures or not. Um, it really just suggests that there is some sort of neuronal function, uh, sorry, neuronal dysfunction present. Okay, next question. Would you elaborate on head circumference monitoring? What would one see if changes and what are implications? Sure, absolutely. So um, head circumference monitoring is something that we really uh, routinely do in children, and it's really usually younger children, um, younger than about five years of age or, or so. Um, and the reason to do this is that there can be a structural abnormality that prevents the fluid that is normally present in the brain that flows uh, through portions of uh, within the brain called the ventricles. Um, if there's a block in that flow, you can have an increase, uh, a sudden increase in the head size, uh, for example, an infant or a toddler. Um, and so um, anytime uh, a child of that age uh, comes into clinic, we routinely measure head circumference. If it happens to be particularly large or there's a sudden acceleration in the rate at which uh, the head is growing, uh, that would potentially be an indication that we need to take some pictures of the brain to make sure there's not um, some sort of obstruction to the flow of that normal fluid within the brain. Okay, we have a bunch of questions coming through. Okay, could a myoclonic last 45 minutes and then never occur again? Myoclonic, yeah. Right. Um, so certainly you can have a series of myoclonic seizures that can last for um, a long time. Um, and it's always possible that a, you know, a seizure may just occur once in an individual's life. So I would say it's certainly possible. Um, even when in, in any case, when an individual has a single seizure, there should be an evaluation, which would typically include at least a neurologic exam and uh, discussion of the event with the neurologist, and often will include um, an EEG and an MRI to make sure that there's not uh, an underlying structural cause um, that could potentially cause seizures. Okay. What medication might a doctor prescribe for febrile seizures that were myoclonic zero to five years and now at 10 years old are more of an absent seizure? A patient is currently on, and I'm not going to say these right, topamurate and clobazam. Yeah. Um, so I, I can only kind of say in general, uh, I, I don't you know, like giving uh, medication advice specifically um, unless I, I, I see a patient. Um, in general, um, we actually don't always, we don't typically treat um, febrile seizures. So uh, if a child, an infant or a child um, has a, a seizure only when they have a, a fever or a severe, a severe illness, um, we don't necessarily uh, continue, we don't necessarily treat those with uh, ongoing uh, anti-epileptic drugs. Um, and then in terms of, you know, those 
types of seizures, those uh, febrile seizures, can potentially evolve into non-febrile seizures, and that would be the definition of epilepsy. So seizures that are occurring without fever uh, would be those unprovoked seizures, and that would, having two or more would be the definition of epilepsy. Um, and absence seizures, it depends on the type of uh, absence seizure, again, whether it's classical or atypical. Uh, most kids with Phelan McDermott syndrome would probably have atypical, um, and it might depend somewhat upon uh, EEG findings as to which medication would be uh, best. So it's certainly a you know a discussion with uh, with a child neurologist or epileptologist in terms of what medication would be best. Okay, and then we have two questions that are kind of similar, so I'm going to combine them. The overarching question is basically can an individual seizure seizures change from one type to another over time? And then someone describes their son is having absence seizures since the age of 10, but now at 15, they're having episodes of falling to the floor or losing consciousness, which happens monthly. So is that seizure changing? Does that happen? Right. That's an excellent question. And yes, uh, seizure types can change with age. Um, so an individual that's having absent seizures might continue to have those and then in addition start to have other types of seizures such as atonic or tonic seizures or um, an individual that has a history of absent seizures those may somewhat wane and not really be uh, as evident but then another seizure type um, emerges again like an atonic or a tonic seizure so that, that's definitely something that can happen in that place. Okay. Okay. Um, so this is another specific one. If this is too close to a, a medical recommendation, then um, this person should speak to their doctor. But my daughter, eight years old, despite taking Kepra, is consistently having short seizures at any time. She is asleep, stiff and lifted arms, eyes locked, screams before it lasts only one minute. So basically at least three times a day. When do you recommend changing medication, adding different meds or just letting it be? Right, right. Well, I, I think what I can say is kind of in general, um, our goal as neurologists and epileptologists is always uh, no seizures, no side effects. So we, we try to make medication adjustments to limit or ideally uh, have seizures completely remit. We don't always get there, but, but that's always um, our goal. Um, so certainly, um, you know, if, if any child is taking a medication um, and still having seizures, um, I, I, I always recommend, you know, at least for my patients, not to wait for that routine follow-up, but in, to instead call and, you know, let me know, uh, you know, within two to four weeks after a medication change, if it does not seem to be working. And then, you know, you can talk to your neurologist or epileptologist about whether a change in that medication is necessary, for example, just going up on the amount of medicine, uh, amount of that medication versus addition of a, another medicine versus changing to another medicine, or even at some point those non-pharmacologic treatments that we talked about. Okay. So within the videos, the atonic seizure immediately resolved. Is the treatment regimen any different for kids like mine who begin with an atonic and go flaccid, and then the seizure morphs into rhythmic, generalized tonic-clonic? Right. That's, that's, that's an important question. Um, so um, certainly atonic seizures can potentially uh, lead us down the road of certain types of medicine. Um, much of what we do in neurology and, and epilepsy is base the type of medications that we try on the type of seizures that are present. Um, so definitely, you know, talking to your neurologist or epileptologist about all of the different types of events that you see is very important in terms of uh, determining what type of medications to try. Okay, next question. Are you familiar with the headband EEG? I believe developed at Stanford. We've never been able to get a good EEG on my son as he will pull off the leads before much can be recorded. Real question is whether an EEG can assist with treatment by better understanding types of seizures placed in the brain. 
Yeah, I, I've heard of the. Uh, I've definitely heard of the uh, band EEG. Uh, we don't use that routinely here um, at Texas Children's. Perhaps something we will uh, do in the future. I, I, I don't know much about um, the quality of the data that we get from that sort of um, uh, that sort of EEG versus a traditional EEG. My uh, kind of naive impression is that we get less data from that, um, and that's. Um, I think it was developed uh, with the idea of using it primarily for individuals that are hospitalized um, uh, to to see if they're if they might be having ongoing seizures. Those individuals might be having ongoing seizures. But I, I definitely you know think it if it hasn't already, it might make its way uh, to other populations. Um, so I, I don't have a lot of a lot of knowledge of it other than you know I've I've, I've heard about it. Okay, and then we have two questions, which are, what type of seizure is this? So, what type of seizure is a series of head nods, often accompanied by one or two hands fluttering, can last for a few seconds, all the way to 20 minutes, sometimes leads to a TC? Yeah, um, you know, so one of the things um, that's always very useful uh, for myself as a neurologist is when uh, families are able to uh, capture a video of, of the event. Um, so I, I would definitely encourage you to do that if you can. Obviously, I know some of them, it sounds like some of them are very short, but it sounds like others might be longer. Um, so you might be able to capture them on a, on a phone, for example, a video on a phone. Um, in general, I mean, you know, potentially it sounds like an atypical uh, absence seizure, but again, it would, um, it would be best to have a video of the event to, to really have an idea. Uh, you know, depending on what that looks like, having a, an EEG might be important in terms of looking for uh, uh, various types of abnormalities that we see that can lead to a, a more specific diagnosis. And then the, the other one that was similar is what type of seizure is, does an individual have when only one side of the body convulses? Yeah, no, that's an important question. Those are uh, usually those partial onset seizures. Um, so that's where the seizure really begins and remains in one part of the brain. Um, and often, for example, if you have a seizure occurring in, on the right side of the brain, you'll have motor symptoms on the left side. So either those rhythmic movements or the stiffening uh, just on the left side of the body. But those uh, sound like potentially a, a partial onset seizure. Okay, and should PMS individuals stay on seizure medication for the rest of their lives? That's a broad right. question. Right. Yeah, that's a that's a tough question. Um, in general, what we recommend is that if an individual goes for two years on a medication with no indication of seizure, that we will try to wean off and, and see if uh, seizures recur. Um, and so I can definitely say in uh, the kids that I've seen with Salem McDermott syndrome, there are some that I've initiated seizure medication. Um, at some point, they've gone for a couple of years without seizures, and we've, we have been able to wean them off. Um, this would certainly typically uh, be more the case for a child that um, either just had a couple of seizures or very infrequent seizures. Um, rather than those individuals that have what we call intractable epilepsy, that is epilepsy that, that take uh, multiple different medications or even combinations of medications to get seizures under control. So, um, you know, one of the criteria is certainly not having seizures for a couple of years, but there can be other factors that weigh in, such as how many medications the child is on, and, and sometimes even the, uh, the abnormalities that we see on the EEG. Okay, and we're going to make this the last question because we are just at the hour. If my child has not had a drop seizure in 10 years, should I not worry about future seizures? And does, epilepsy, does the epilepsy diagnosis need to be discontinued? Right, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, I would never say don't worry, but you know, I can tell you with certainty that your child will not have a seizure again. It's, it's certainly possible. Um, but the longer an, a child goes or an individual goes without having a seizure, uh, the better are the odds that um, that they will not have seizures in the future. 
in general, um, we think that if an individual goes for five years without a seizure, that their risk of having additional seizures has probably gone back down to somewhere close to um, the general population, which is uh, one to two percent. Although I, I would caution with failed McDermott syndrome because of the underlying genetic diagnosis that it's probably not really that low. It's probably higher than that. Um, so again, I would never say don't worry, but um, certainly if your child has not had a seizure in 10 years, there's no indication to start a medication um, if they're off of all anti epileptic medication. Great. Well, Dr. Holder, thank you so much. This was excellent. We got some great questions, good topics. Um, as usual, this has been recorded and we will make it available on YouTube for either rewatching or for um, those who are not able to join. So thank you all for joining. And Dr. Holder, thank you so much for your time today. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.